Hello, my name is Dr. Joseph McHale. I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Medical Officer of the International Myeloma Foundation, and I'm a professor at the Translational Genomics Research Institute. As always, ASCO and EHA were chock full of great abstracts uh, in the field of multiple myeloma. And my plan in this video is to give you an overview of the themes that emerged from this meeting uh, that are relevant to us in the myeloma community and, of course, very relevant uh, to our patients as they continue to battle this disease. I'm going to think of them as five themes together. Theme number one is induction therapy or the initial therapy that we give to patients um, as they are diagnosed with multiple myeloma. And the key theme here is that we have seen continued interest in moving from triplets to quadruplets, especially in patients going to autologous stem cell transplant. What I mean by that, instead of giving a three drug combination like VRD or maybe even KRD, we're seeing more and more studies demonstrating the benefit of adding a fourth drug such as daratumumab VRD or daratumumab VTD or even esetuximab with VRD or esetuximab uh, with KRD. And so I think the myeloma community is moving this way. We continue at each of these meetings to gain more information about how we can get a very deep response early on as deep responses, as we know, last uh, longer uh, in patients with multiple myeloma, and this becomes an important objective for us. The second major theme that comes through is the continued use of autologous stem cell transplant. Although in many ways we'd love to get rid of transplant because it's a pretty challenging process, we do continue to see studies that demonstrate their benefit. The Forte study, which compared 12 months of KRD, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, to eight months of KRD plus transplant, continues to demonstrate in the longer term the benefit of having had the transplant. Interestingly, there was a British study, the Cardamon study, uh, that demonstrated that maybe we could overcome the need of transplant by using carfilzomib cyclophosphamide dex, but we still need a little bit more data from that because those patients that did get the transplant in that study had a much deeper response, especially in MRD negativity. So in some ways, the jury is still out, but uh, as I often say, a, a transplant remains the standard of care in multiple myeloma uh, until it's clearly uh, dethroned, and so it does continue uh, to be used. The third major theme, which is really, I think, fascinating, has been the role of maintenance therapy in myeloma. We've learned that we give induction therapy plus or minus transplant, but then patients stay on maintenance therapy over the long term. And we had a particularly important study in that Forte study that I mentioned that randomized patients after that initial treatment to either receive lenalidomide maintenance, which is pretty much the standard of care, or give them carfilzomib plus lenalidomide maintenance. And what was quite fascinating in this study uh, was that those patients that had the dual maintenance uh, clearly benefited from it in that uh, they remained in uh, remission uh, for significantly longer, that the three-year progression-free survival rate was 90% in standard risk patients who got KR uh, versus only 73% with R. This was also sustained even in the higher risk groups. They evaluated this in high risk myeloma and indeed what they called double hit myeloma. Uh, we've also seen from other studies like the Griffin study where uh, maintenance has been added, uh, daratumumab was added to maintenance uh, with lenalidomide uh, that there is a potential benefit of this. By contrast, the Cassiopeia study, which really got a lot of head scratching, showed that these were patients that received daratumumab plus VTD, bortezomib, thalidomide, and dexamethasone, versus just VTD. But there was a second randomization. We knew that daravtd was better than VTD. That was shown quite clearly before. But what they did then is they did a second randomization to receive nothing, a placebo, or to receive daratumumab. The daratumumab helped in maintenance overall, but when we looked specifically at those patients that had had daratumumab in their induction, it didn't seem to make a, a, a helpful benefit by staying on daratumumab through maintenance. So we need more time to digest this and to gain more information, but it begs the question of how many cycles do we need to give a monoclonal antibody for uh, during induction therapy, consolidation, and indeed maintenance. So we'll learn more about that as we go with time. Theme number four 
was high risk myeloma. There was a lot of emphasis and work in trying to understand high risk better, in defining it better. Many of our studies now are including a careful evaluation of patients that have high risk disease, in particular, this notion of 1Q, where there's an abnormality in chromosome 1, uh, and sometimes there is multiple copies of parts of chromosome 1 that can really have an adverse effect. And I think the theme that emerges is we need to understand this cytogenetic abnormality better. And it does appear that when we more intensely treat these patients, there was a, a British study that, you, that looked at using really quite intense therapy with daratumumab, bortezomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, and cyclophosphamide all together. It does appear that we can have better outcomes when we become more aggressive in treating high-risk myeloma. And lastly, but definitely not least, was all of the wonderful emerging therapies in relapse myeloma. Of course, there are other things we could discuss, but we can't think of this ASCO and EHA and not talk about uh, CAR T cell therapy, such as the SILTA cell study that showed to us really an unprecedented 98% response rate. Um, really quite amazing, may well be the next CAR T cell therapy available to us. But also we saw many of these bispecific therapies, these drugs that hook onto the tumor and to a local T cell. We saw teclistimab with a 65% response rate and, and talquetimab with a 70% response rate. I mean, really unheard of previously, these kinds of response rates that we really do think will change the landscape of myeloma for the future. So this has been an exciting ASCO and EHA, so much that we think are uh, going to benefit our patients with myeloma. And lastly, before I go, I'm gonna encourage you, there's one abstract I specifically haven't talked about because it really requires its own discussion, which was the long-term Maya results. This was what we call a late-breaking abstract at EHA, uh, where we saw a survival benefit of patients who had stayed on daratumumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone versus just just lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Uh, and, and so please uh, watch that because you'll learn more about that important study. Thank you so much for your attention.